Okay, so we are happy to have with us today, Christiane and Kelly. Uh, they're both uh, students from um, the NS ANSC course from Angela. And we're gonna start the presentation with Kelly. So Kelly Tremblay graduated with a bachelor in animal biology last year at the University of Guelph. And she's now pursuing a master's in animal behavior and welfare, but also has a special interest in selective breeding and genetics. Kelly is set to graduate at the end of August and cannot wait to start her journey in the industry. So thank you, uh, Kelly, for being here with us. And it's your, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, can you guys see me? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so as Samela said, I'm Kelly. Um, the paper I decided to talk about today is the genetic improvement of egg laying traits in Fayumi chickens bred under conditions of heat stress through selection and gene expression studies. So a little bit of background um, on this study. Uh, it was published in the Journal of Thermal Biology in 2020. Um, it was conducted by Lamia Radwin, um, and she is part of the poultry production department um, at a university in Egypt. Uh, the birds that they decided to choose for this study was the Fayumi chickens um, because it is native to Egypt, so it's the one they primarily use. Um, one of the reasons why this bird is particularly good to use is because um, since they are native to Egypt, they are very well adapted to the local temperature there, which is quite high compared to Canada. Um, they found that this is because they have an increased expression of the S or the HSP70 gene, um, which I'll go into a little bit later what it is. Um, they also have a very good immune system, um, which makes them good at fighting off some of the diseases that are found in their local area. Um, they have also very good eggshell strength and structure, um, which is one of the qualities we want in eggs uh, so that they don't get damaged while shipping. Um, but the one thing about them is that they have poor or low quality production. Um, so here where we see chickens who have who lay like multiple eggs like every day, like all year round, they kind of, I believe I saw that they only produce about about 100 to 150 eggs a year. Um, the goal of this study was to see if they could improve productivity and eggshell quality um, during times of heat stress or high ambient temperatures, and they wanted to see if they could do this through selective breeding and gene expression. So they split up the chickens that they had into two groups. So they had the controlled group, which had 500 chicks, um, and they were reared from day one at 33 degrees Celsius, and they uh, gradually reduced that until they got to about 22 to 24 degrees Celsius. And then the heat stress group, um, again, they had 500 chicks total, um, and the way they did it was a little bit more complicated. It was three to five days old. They exposed them to 40 degree temperatures for four hours a day, um, and then they did this again at eight weeks and 12 weeks. And then from weeks 20 to 50, um, they were exposed to constant temperatures of 30 to 33 degrees Celsius. So the way they planned on doing their selective breeding um, was a little bit different between the two groups. So for the control group, the parent generation, um, they just took random females and random males in the group and just allowed them to breed. And they did this for, again, um, after they get they got the F1 generation, um, they did the same thing. They had random females and random males, put them together, and we got F2 generation. For the uh, heat stress group, they were more picky. So with the parent generation and the F1 generation, they took their best females in the group, so they had the best egg production and the best um, eggshell quality, so the strength mostly, and then they took them and bred them with the male siblings within the group. Um, they didn't specify if they picked the best males of the group or not, so I'm not too sure on that, but they did at least pick the best females. Um, so for sample collection and analysis, um, they kind of looked at two categories of things. So the egg traits themselves and then the gene expression. So for egg traits, they were looking at egg production and egg weight. Um, for this, they collected 400 eggs um, per generation and per treatment groups for, four, for 90 days after uh, the onset of lay. For egg, egg strength and thickness, they took 180 of those 400 eggs um, that they collect at week 34, and they used an in, instron tool um, to test the strength of the eggshell. So basically the tool just goes and tries to fracture it and sees how much pressure is needed to fracture the egg. 
and then they used a di digital micrometer um, to test the thickness. Um, and I believe they took three uh, spots of the egg at the equator, um, equal distance apart, to take a, an average of all three. And then for the eggshell matrix proteins, um, they took 24 eggshell samples at the 34 week. Uh, range and then they it was a huge process, but they basically cleaned it, they pulverized it into a powder, they centrifuged it, and then they isolated the particles. Um, and at that point, they could extract the OC17. Um, for the gene expression, they were looking at the heat shock protein 90, um, and then the OC17, which is the OV Kleindin 17, and they were looking at the mRNA. So for both of them, they took 24 samples for the heat shock protein. It was from the liver, and that was taken at uh, at six days of age and 35 uh, weeks of age. And then for the OC17, they took 24 uterus samples um, at 35 weeks. And both of them were analyzed with two-step quantitative real-time PCR. So I took these directly from the paper. Um, it's just kind of to show the results of what they ended up finding. So I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but if you can, it'll be easier. Um, so for the parent gene, or for the parents uh, in the egg production, you can see that between the parent to the second generation, the levels kind of stay the same. So it's 79, 78, and then 79. In the heat stress group, you can tell that it's lower than the control group. So it's 71 instead of the 79. But the difference is instead of kind of just staying equal throughout the generations, although they're lower than the control, they are slowly getting higher. So there's an increase of three uh, between the parent uh, generation and the first F1 generation. And then between F1 and F2, there is uh, a jump of two. So although they're still not as great, they showed a lot of an improvement through the breeding selection. And you can see the same trend for egg weight, um, eggshell strength, and pretty much everything. Um, and then the difference between the control and the SAG, um, basically that just kind of shows um, the reduction in the spread between the two. So the 7.18, that would be the difference between the parent control and parent heat for the egg production. So it was seven, and then the F1, you can see there's a, a, a smaller difference between the two. So even though there's still a difference, like I said, at least they're getting better. Um, and then you can see that trend again through all the the different uh, traits that they were looking for. Um, and then I included the realized uh, heritability and response to selection during the heat stress. So this is just for, it doesn't include the control group, but just the heat stress. Um, and it was just showing kind of uh, like the heritability basically. So the first generation from the parent, um, it was seen that uh, egg production had a heritability of 0 0.27. Um, and then you, maybe you noticed, I, it took me a little bit to notice it at first when I was looking at these graphs, but it says second generation twice. Um, and the differences between the two is, so the second generation, that's 0 0.45. Um, that's just with taking the best of the best um, of that generation um, and the ones basically they were going to breed again. Um, the 0 0.8, that's the difference between the whole generation, so the F2 generation, and the best of the F2 generation. Um, just to kind of see, to show how much of the difference there is between the best of the group and kind of the, the ones lagging behind a little bit. Oops. Um, and then this is for the gene expression results. Um, they did it a little bit more in graphs, uh, just to show, I find it a little bit easier to understand when there's graphs. Um, so for the OC17, um, you can see in the control group, uh, so this is what was collected from the eggs and not from the uterus sample. Um, you can see that the control groups pretty much throughout all of them are pretty constant throughout the three generations. Um, because again, there was no really breeding selection or anything, so the population just remains stable. Um, for the heat stress group, you can tell that uh, the OC17 actually started higher than the control group, which makes sense because they're under heat stress, um, but it actually goes down through the generations. So I'll talk about it in the next slide, but just keep that in mind. Um, and then for the heat shock protein 90 levels, again, pretty much the same uh, for the control. Um, and then you can see that Again, the heat stress is higher than the control, and uh, throughout the generations, it actually gets higher, so it's more expressed.
So um, throughout the whole study, um, you can see even through the graphs that I just showed that uh, the heat stress did in fact decrease egg production weight and all the properties that they were looking for compared to the control. Um, this is typically seen because you know chickens are intaking less feed uh, because they're trying to reduce the metabolic heat they're they're creating in their body so they're eating less um, so they have less nutrients to give towards egg production. Um, the redirection of blood flow to the extremities also causes um, egg production to go down and then increased panting also uh, cut, makes them use more energy but they're not eating enough so then they just don't have enough energy to create eggs. Um, it was found that in the study that uh, egg production and eggshell strength are quantitative traits um, so that means that they are affected both by genetics and by non-genetics uh, such as the environment so the heat stress group. Um, so although that, you know, we can see improvements with the genetics that we did, um, that they are still, in fact, influenced by the environment, no matter what. Um, and then it was also found that there was an inverse relationship between the OC17 gene expression levels and uh, the eggshell strength. So that was the, the fact that it was going down through the generations. Um, and I found this kind of interesting at first until I kind of dived in a little bit deeper to see why. Um, and in the paper itself, it doesn't really explain. Um, so just reading the paper myself, I did not understand why there's an inverse relationship and what what was happening. Um, so the best explanation I can find was that OC17 um, is needed in the eggshell, you know, like matrix, but um, to make it like to have better eggshell strength. Um, it seems like more other gene expressions and other levels need to be higher. So then I'm not sure what it is that I didn't find that, but to have higher egg strength, um, the OC17 has to go down, so probably because something else is going up and that balance just has to remain. Um, so that's what I was able to find. And then uh, for the expression of um, the heat shock protein, that was very, dependent on the treatment group, the age, and the generation. Um, and they explained it because the, uh, the liver is very susceptible to heat stress. Um, so the longer that these chickens are living in this heat stress, heat stress, um, the liver is slowly not being able to keep up anymore, so it'll de decrease with age. But because we are selecting for it through breeding, um, it'll increase throughout the generations, but then de decrease as the bird gets older. Um, and then it was also found that it has a high level of heritability, which is why it's increasing so much throughout the generations. So overall, what they found in the paper was that uh, selective breeding can lessen the impact of heat stress on all the reproductive characteristics that they looked, like, uh, looked at throughout the study and enhance heat tolerance. Um, a, they proved that heat tolerance was a heritable trait, which is a good thing for the industry because then we can try and select for that through breeding programs. Um, and then it was also found that per perhaps using the OC17 um, levels, we can use that in the industry to um, predict how strong the eggshells are going to be and then maybe find a way to implement that into a, a breeding program into like the criteria um and that way if we're able to see how much you know some of the chickens are producing the of the oc17 then we can select them and then that way in uh, in further generations we can have stronger eggshells that's it um Thank you, Kelly, for your presentation. Uh, if anyone has questions for Kelly, feel free to turn on your cameras and microphone and ask her questions. Just turn on, you need to, yeah. Is it good? Can you hear us, Kelly? Yeah, I can hear. Yay, okay. Um, I was wondering if, with that last point that you mentioned in the conclusions about OC17 mm -hmm. and its 
the the idea of incorporating it into a breeding plan. Um, have there been any studies that look at perhaps the relationship between OC17 and then the eggshell strength tools that you mentioned, like in the methods and stuff, to see if there's a high correlation there or if it's reliable? Um, not that they mentioned in this paper um, or that I was able to find. Um, the only, yeah, the only thing really was that, you know, they found they were they found that it was an inverse relationship um and that um the more the more oc17 you have then the less strength basically your your eggshell's going to have so i guess you know looking for chickens with uh higher levels might be not your best bet Anyone else? Uh, Lucas has a question. Okay, well, okay. Well, Lucas, think about his question. I don't have a question uh, for you, Kelly. Mm -hmm. So on your discussion, you said that uh, high levels of editability. So I didn't quite understand what you meant by that. Could you explain a little bit more? Or which one? Uh, high levels of editability is on the discussion uh, slides on the as the last point I think. Oh, yeah, this one there. Um, so basically, what I meant, I might maybe didn't just write it right. Um, so that. Okay, so sorry. Uh, yeah. So the SP or H SP ninety um is very heritable. So uh. You know, if you have a few chickens in this in the F1 generation and you breed them, um, the likelihood of that being passed on and the following chickens um, or chicks being born are also going to have higher levels of S of that uh, heat shock protein. But the AS uh, HSP90 is a gene, right? Um, it's it's a protein. Okay, but. See, I'm just confused because I don't understand how, like, a gene or a protein can, like, have high levels of irritability. Because normally, when you talk about irritability, it's about, like, a trait that you can mm -hmm. measure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I just don't understand. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, so from how I understood it through the paper was that the, so the heat shock protein um, is produced in the liver. Um, and I guess it's linked to something like the M mRNA levels. They they tested for it. So I'm I'm thinking they didn't specify in the paper whether it's the like the levels in the liver that um they they said that had higher hair heritability or if it was the mRNA levels. They didn't specify in the paper. So I'm assuming it's the um the mRNA levels, but Okay, so then it would be the high levels of expression, probably. That's what I'm assuming they meant, but okay. they used, they just said high heritability. Okay, okay, perfect. Anyone else has questions? Okay, Lucas now has a question. Uh, no, I just took my time to think about the, the shell um, structure or whatever you were talking, like quality and how, mm -hmm. how hard it was. Uh, did you get to look or to go after the physiological pathways on why would that be the expression of that gene, how it relates to shell uh, quality? No, I didn't look into it too much, to be honest. Um, and the, I I liked this paper, but I also didn't like it too much because they talked about some things, but then didn't really explain what they were. So like the, at one point they they mentioned like the palisade later, layer of the eggshell. I had to go look up what that is because they mentioned it like twice and didn't explain anything about it so and I found they did that with this and like why did they choose OC17 um I, I wasn't sure why that specifically is what they were looking for um so and I didn't look into it more um other than kind of seeing why it had an inverse relationship to try and understand that but yeah I don't know how it plays a role in the whole matrix or anything like that okay um my other question is about the HSPs did you go after those as well to understand why a heat shock protein was related to ag uh, the, quality and structure? The what, sorry? 
the heat shock proteins because that's what HSP means. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what was the rest of your question? <laughs> if you also uh, went to look after it to understand how it relates to shell or air quality, like why heat can can cause any changes in that. The so you're sorry, I'm not understanding well. So the are you talking about the heat shock protein ninety, or are you just talking about heat stress? Because you're looking into heat stress, right? Yep. And then you found a heat shock protein associated with quality of the eggs, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I I couldn't get what's the relationship between what you found and what they were like what they found and what they were looking at. And if you if you did look at it and you studied the the HSPs to understand mm -hmm. what happened. Or if they talk about it anyway. Yeah, no, they don't really talk about it. Um, from what I understand, um, the the protein just, I don't know, it kind of helps. It, it, yeah, I think it just kind of kickstarts their their system more. From what I understood, mm -hmm. um, to to help them fight all the the negatives that come with the heat stress. Um, but yeah, they again, they didn't really talk about why they chose these specific things to check for the the gene expression and all that. They kind of just threw it in and I was like, okay, I guess I'll go with it. Okay, so if anyone has questions, we have uh, one last question for Kelly. No? Okay. So we're gonna move on and uh, have the presentation from Christiani now. You can share your screen, your presentation, your slides, Christiane, if you want. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, so Christiane Sinhalaji is the first year PhD student under the supervision of Professor Angela Canovas. Uh, her PhD thesis focuses on the transcriptomic and genomic approaches to unravel, uh, unravel the underlying genetics of sheep in response to gas intestinal nematoid gene infection. A former Erasmus Mundus scholar, she earned her double master degree in animal breeding and genetics from the Swedish, Swedish uh, University of Agricultural Science uh, and the University of Gotehan, Germany. She's original from Sri Lanka and has completed her bachelor in animal science and fisheries and first master's degree in food science and technology at the University of Perundinia, Sri Lanka. Her overreaching goal is to contribute to sustainable agriculture through the genetic improvement of livestock. Thank you for being with us today and the floor is yours. So much, Sandra, for the introduction. Uh, as Sandra mentioned, I'm Krishani Singhalage. I'm a PhD student under Dr. Angela Canovas. Uh, today, I'm going to present a paper titled uh, Response of Rambule Lambs to an Artificial Gastrointestinal Nematode Infection. Uh, this study um, was published in 2022 uh, in a journal of animals, and study was done by Jacob and the research group in Texas, USA. Uh, here is the overview of my presentation. Uh, it goes from uh, introduction, objectives, and hypothesis, materials, and method, results, and discussion at the conclusion. Uh, first, let's look at the, what is this gastrointestinal nematode infection. It is one of the major uh, problems affecting in uh, sheep industry worldwide. Animals uh, will be infected when they are grazing on contaminated pasture. This occurs when a mixture of species of in, uh, nematodes infect the abomasum and the intestine of sheep. Hemunculus contortus uh, is the most pathogenic and the dominant nematode that causes gastrointestinal nematode infection. It is a blood worm uh, that infects the abomasum of sheep. As uh, shown in this picture, the nematode, uh, nematode life cycle is completed inside the host and outside of environment. Uh, adult nem uh, nematodes lay eggs in the abomasum of sheep and uh, those pass into the environment via feces. Then uh, the life cycle continues uh, outside and L3 larvae uh, stage uh, infect uh, 
uh, is the infective stage. When animals are grazing on the contaminated pasture, this infective stage will ingest and uh, this L3 maturing to L4 and L5 and then to the adult larvae. Once these adult larvae sexually matured, they start laying eggs, um, nearly uh, 10,000 uh, eggs per day. This adult larvae, in addition, these adult larvae suck blood from the intestinal wall of uh, animals. Uh, there are several uh, clinical signs that we can identify a use of uh, uh, used to identify this urgent infected sheep: uh, diarrhea, gradual weight loss, uh, reduced productivity, reduced uh, feed efficiency, uh, anemic conditions, and also in uh, severe cases, animal deaths. Uh, all this will lead to animal welfare issues and economic losses to farmers due to reduced productivity and increased cost for treatments and management. This is greatly affect the quality of wool, skin, milk, and meat production as well. Um, control of uh, control strategies worldwide are based uh, can control strategies for gene infection are uh, worldwide are based on the use of anthelmintic drugs and partial management. However, case of anthelmintic resistance uh, in nematodes and drug residues in food and environment are major problems associated with these uh, conventional methods. Interestingly, uh, anthelmintic resistance appeared to be a heritable trait in nematodes based on the literature. Therefore, genetic selection for sheep with increased resistance to gastrointestinal nematode infection offers a more sustainable option to reduce parasitism and also to improve health and productivity of animals. Um, this study objectives uh, were to measure fecal leg count and fat cell volume uh, to describe the response of Rambula lands uh, challenge artificially with Himalcus contours, and also to determine how level of uh, resulting infection impact their health and productive production traits, including weight gain and wool uh, growth. They hypothesized that the response of lambs to control challenge of uh, hemuncus uh, would result in varied fecal accounts and uh, previously estimated, uh, and also they hypothesized that uh, previously estimated sire fecal account uh, estimated breeding values would be predictive of these measures. Uh, and also they hypothesized that fecal account and fat cell volume would have a negative correlation with production traits. Uh, now let's look at the materials and methods. Uh, this study was done in Texas, USA, and the samples were collected from uh, Texas AM, uh, a and uh, Acre Research Registered Rambulic Flock. Uh, used from this flock group uh, mated with uh, two Rambulic rams. These rams were uh, previously phenotyped and breeding values were estimated for post-weaning fecal accounts um, as a uh, Sire L and uh, they named them as Sire L and Sire H based on this uh, the estimated breeding values for fecal egg counts. Uh, this study, uh, the study population consists of uh, 77 purebred lambs uh, from so called mating, and these uh, Rambule uh, lambs uh, sheep breed. Um, this Rambule sheep breed is an important breed uh, to US sheep industry and is noted for producing uh, high quality meat and wool. Uh, let's look at the experimental design, how they performed this study. Uh, lambs were raised on native pasture until weaning with their dams and age at 60, lambs were weaned and weighed and fecal samples were collected from all lambs uh, for pre-screening for uh, gastrointestinal nematodes. Uh, this confirmed all uh, lambs had sufficient exposure to nematode pre-weaning while they were on the pasture. Therefore, lambs were uh, orally drenched with a uh, full dosage of uh, cydectin and prohibit uh, anthelmintic drugs and placed uh, them in dry lot for two weeks. Uh, a follow-up uh, fecal account was done for subsample. Uh, 20 lambs uh, from this uh, flock, uh, 20 lambs were conducted two uh, weeks later and no eggs were identified in any of the samples. Therefore, they uh, uh, started the next step of their study and the lambs were maintained in two dry lot pens based on the sex for 68 days uh, before initiation of the proper study. A later experiment began uh, and all lambs were artificially infected with approximately 10,000 humongous contours larvae, L3 stage larvae. 
Um, in this study, uh, three indicator traits were used to assess the response of uh, Rambule labs to artificial humongous in uh, infection, humongous contortus infection. Worm burden was assessed using fecal egg count. Fecal samples were collected directly from the rectum and fecal uh, egg count were measured by the number of eggs per gram of feces uh, using modified McMaster technique. Uh, blood samples were collected to assess parasitic uh, included pathology using pack cell volume uh, and measured for hemochrotic uh, percentage to determine anemic level. Body weight was measured to calculate the average daily gain. Uh, the, uh, the collection of uh, fecal egg counts, uh, pack cell volume and body uh, weight uh, was repeated at weekly intervals for six subsequent weeks with uh, the exception of fecal egg count at week one. Uh, due to the developing humongous contortus were not sexually matured to produce eggs at uh, week one. Um, after the final uh, data collection, lambs were treated with anthelmintics and wool quality, uh, wool, wool quality was measured to assess the production traits. All lambs were uh, shown 120 days uh, post artificial infection and wool quality metrics were collected. Uh, as wool quality uh, metrics, breeze Fleece weight, uh, fiber diameter, fiber diameter standard deviation, uh, standard deviation along the fiber, and staple length of the fiber length uh, were used. Uh, in the data analysis, uh, such software were used uh, with the generalized linear mix model uh, with the repeated measures. And in this uh, model, uh, sire, peak, and sex uh, used as fixed effects. And the initial lamb weight was considered, uh, except in uh, average daily gain trait, uh, uh, considered as a covariate. Uh, in addition, uh, Pearson correlation coefficients were, uh, between uh, traits were considered, uh, calculated to determine the phenotypic correlation between traits. Now let's move on to the results and discussion of this uh, paper. Uh, this, um, Figure A illustrates the mean fecal egg count for all lambs. And figure uh, first, let's look at the fecal egg count uh, results. The figure A illustrates the mean uh, fecal egg count for all lambs, and figure B illustrates the mean fecal egg count for each sire group for weeks uh, from three to six. As we can see here, at uh, week two, lambs did not display fecal egg count uh, above zero until week three. This is uh, due to the reproductive development of nematodes, as I mentioned uh, before. For all lambs, uh, fecal account continued to increase from week three to six. In figure B, uh, the mean fecal account across weeks uh, three to six differed by sire, with the offspring of sire L denoted in blue color, uh, having a lower fecal account when compared to the offspring of sire's uh, H or sire H. This may be due to the uh, lambs from sire L uh, or the sire with low fecal egg count uh, estimated breeding value having a more rapid and favorable immune responses. Consequently, it appears that the um, sire fecal egg count estimated breeding values are predictive of uh, fecal egg count in rambule lambs. However, uh, in week five, we can see uh, five, five and six, they are there is, there is no uh, difference was detected between this uh, sire group uh, for mean fecal egg counts. Uh, this figure, uh, these two figures shows the um, pack cell volume uh, results. Figure A illustrates the mean peak, uh, pack cell volume percentage for all lambs, and figure B shows the mean uh, pack cell volume percentage for each sire group across the tri trial. Uh, according to figure A, the mean pack cell volume for all lambs decreased at week two. This is due to the increase in adult nematode count. Um, in figure B, there is no significant difference in uh, pack cell volumes was observed by sire. Therefore, it does not appear that sire fecal egg count, uh, fe fecal egg count estimated breeding values are predictive of uh, pack cell volume in rambule lambs as within uh, sex. Sire group analysis did not significantly uh, different. Uh, this uh, figure shows the uh, fecal account and the pack cell, pack cell um, 
volume based on the sex. Fig figure A uh, illustrates the mean fac uh, fecal egg count for lambs by sex, while uh, figure B illustrates the mean pack cell volume for lambs by sex. Uh, in this fi figure, A, uh, no significant difference in mean fecal egg count between sexes were detected. However, at week, week six, we can see that female lambs uh, tended to have a high fecal egg count than males. According to figure B, by sex, pack cell volume differed um, across the tri trial, and pack cell, pack cell volume of female lambs was significantly high at week two to six compared to male lambs. According to pack cell uh, volume results, female lambs appeared to be more resilient to humongous contours infection than males, as evident, evidenced by the greater reduction in pack cell volume in male lambs. For all lambs, a humongous contortus larvae had begun feed on uh, host blood by week two. However, uh, fecal egg count were, observe, were not observe, uh, not above the zero until week three. Therefore, this confirms that larvae begin consuming uh, host blood before sexual maturity. Uh, this figure uh, shows the average lamb weight uh, on the left axis and uh, included including both sexes and average daily gain um, on the right axis across the trial, trial uh, of humongous controllers infected lambs. Despite the continuous increase of fecal egg count and initial decrease in pack cell volume, uh, lambs continue to gain weight at each weekly uh, interval. However, average daily gain weight of uh, lambs decreased throughout the trial after two weeks, denoted in this blue color graph. Uh, it is unclear if this is, can be attributed to effect of parasitism or if this is a result of decreasing feed efficiency as lambs uh, reach mature weight. This study uh, reported that uh, mean average, um, even though it is not showing here, this study reported that uh, mean average daily gain did not differ by sire. However, male lambs gained weight significantly faster than uh, female lambs. Uh, this table uh, shows the mean wool measurements by sire and by sets of lambs artificially infected uh, with this uh, humongous contortus. Uh, according to this table, interestingly, uh, fiber density, fiber density is standard deviation, and uh, wool length or the uh, staple length measurements were significantly high in um, uh, high high in uh, sire high group lambs compared to uh, low group. By sex, uh, face weight measurements were significantly high in male lambs relative to female lambs. Uh, this table shows the phenotypic correlation between fecal egg count, fat cell volume, and average, uh, average daily gain weight, uh, average daily gain, and wool cultimetric. Significant correlations are uh, bolded. For all lambs, a negative correlation was observed uh, between mean fecal egg count and uh, place weight and average daily gain. Uh, average daily gain was positively uh, correlated with all wool quality metrics. And also this, uh, the ever uh, as seen in this, uh, shown in this um, blue box. Uh, when uh, correlation was analyzed by sires, the significant negative correlation between fecal egg count and both uh, place weight and average tail gain uh, was still observed only, uh, even though we saw a significant difference in the previous slide. The significant negative, significant negatively correlation between this fecal egg count, uh, place weight, and average tail gain weight. Uh, when we uh, correlation uh, analysis are performed based on the size, uh, that is only uh, observed in. Uh, sire H group. Also, negatively correlation, uh, negative correlation was observed in uh, between fecal egg count and pack cell volume for uh, sire L group. Uh, in addition, average uh, daily gain was positively correlated with whole quality metrics except for the fleece weight and the fleece length in uh, sire L group. However, uh, Average tail gain uh, in sire edge group of strings showed a positive correlation with place weight and uh, place uh, fiber diameter and fiber di uh, diameter standard deviation. When uh, 
when correlations were analyzed by sex for female labs were uh, in, in for female labs fecal leg count was negatively correlated with pack cell volume average daily gain and positively correlated with uh, wool length however uh, neither of these correlations were significant uh, in male labs pack cell volume but in males uh, fecal leg count was negatively correlated with uh, place weight and pack cell volume uh, was positively correlated with uh, in the with the average daily gain with in both sexes in females uh, average daily gain uh, was negatively correlated with uh, place length and positively correlated with uh, uh, fiber density place weight and uh, standard deviation along uh, fiber whereas in males average daily gain was uh, average daily gain was positively correlated with uh, fiber density, fiber density standard deviation and uh, standard deviation along uh, fiber. However, um, in this study, uh, shearing of lambs occurred uh, four months after the uh, nematode infection. Thus, the effect of the parasitic parasites on wool quality cannot be directly determined from this study. Uh, with that all, um, here we can conclude this results of the study. Uh, the results demonstrated that uh, the varied responses of rambular lambs to artificial parasitic challenge uh, and also uh, fecal account results by sire were in, in line with the prediction of sire post weaning fecal account estimated breeding values while confirming their second uh, hypothesis. Um, also, this study provided evidence that artificial challenges can be used for identifying varying responses of rambulate lambs uh, for aid in future genetic uh, selection strategies. As a suggestion, um, uh, for further investigations are required with large number of in order to prove these uh, uh, results. Uh, for the further investigations are required with large number of animals and for longer period. Uh, of uh, continuation of ex uh, examination to better understand the potential uh, differential responses in rambulate following an artificial in infection. This is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for your listening. And if you have any questions or suggestions, thank you, Christiana, for your presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions? If you're online, you can turn on your camera and your microphone and ask, ask your question. So I do have a question for you. Um, I don't know if I didn't hear you, but did they select uh, the males? They just they select the high and low. They select them just from our random population that has the high and the low count, or mm -hmm. is a population that comes from um, a breeding program that has been selecting for a long time. Yeah, uh, that that uh, it, since uh, in US uh, in Texas state they started this um, uh, evaluation of fecal account since 2015. Uh, so then that is come from a, a evaluation program. So they oh. they yeah for the sire sire uh, you're talking about the breeding evaluation for two sires, right? Yeah. Okay. Anyone has questions? Okay, so we have here a question. Yes. Um, I just had a quick question about this is outside of what I uh, am looking at right now. So what is the packed cell volume measurement? And is there an expected relationship with other uh, measurements that are used in these studies like fecal egg count? Or uh, I'm just wondering, like, what is that measurement actually looking at? Yeah, uh, pack cell volume is the fraction of the uh, blood cells. Uh, you know, it, once the animals in uh, in case this uh, nematodes or the infection, once the animals uh, infected with this uh, nematode infection, they start suck blood, uh, sucking blood from the animals, right? So then the animals' blood count can uh, blood cells can lower, or animal can that can lead to anemic conditions in animals. So then in order to measure these anemic conditions, the pack cell uh, volume is can be used as an indicator indic indicator trait. Uh, that means if the fecal leg count is higher, the pack cell uh, volume should be lower. There should be a negative correlation between these two traits. 
I hope you understood what I mean. Yeah, she did a OK sign. Uh, anyone has questions? OK. Um, yeah, so I do have another question, Christiane. <laughs> On yes, the paper, do they say why the um, this difference? Do they explain the difference uh, for the results that they found in the females and the males? Because for the correlation, they were pretty high. Like for the females, like was minus 40, which is it's pretty, it's pretty OK. Yeah, do they explain why the females respond different? Uh no, Samla, they, I think since they, they have this small population, they did not mention about why uh, male, female, this big difference. But but they have reported that uh, previous studies, some of the, uh, they have cited some previous studies had also shown similar kind of results. Yeah. Do you have any hints why that could be, like any ideas? Uh, you, you're talking about the, which which trait that are you talking about? Is the same thing, like you, yeah, like do you have any hints why the females would respond better to infection than the males? You know, I have no idea why. But they were talking about the pack cell volume based on uh, you're talking about this, especially the pack cell volume, right? Uh, yes, male population had lower. Count compared, sorry, yeah, lower count compared to the female population, but um, I have no idea why uh, the, this difference. Is. So, if you have any suggestions, I would be happy to hear. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I I think uh, Colin is saying that maybe preferential treatment, but I think on this study they were treated the same, right? And the other thing that maybe uh, Samla they did not mention uh, uh, which uh, uh, how many individuals how many female individuals how many male individuals came from each sire. So maybe a high if we even if you look at this here a high number of individuals from the high sire right. So then maybe if the females are high in that high group may, oh, sorry low group the results can be changed right. Yeah, so Colin has an idea what could ha be. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> he said to forget about it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, if anyone has any questions, let's call. Okay, okay. So thank you, Christiana, for today. Thank you, Kelly. It was an amazing presentation from uh, both of you. And if Angela has anything to say. Yes, just a question was all on the one asking questions right from the room. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> OK, because I recognize her voice, but I wanted to be sure because they know that this is one part of the of the evaluation asking questions. Perfect. Thank you very much, Avalon, for asking both questions. <laughs> You're welcome. OK, thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see you guys next Friday. Uh, next Friday, we're going to have again this round of paper presentations. So see you then. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>